Welcome to Biz News Briefing this Monday, the 30th of September. I'm Alec Hogg. Big news over the weekend comes from the Middle East. We'll have some insights for you there on what is going to happen to Hezbollah and indeed to the Lebanese-Israeli altercations uh, and what it means for the world. That's from our partners at the Financial Times. Also today, we'll be giving a lot of attention to the fracas in Shwani, hearing from Neil De Beer and Muzi Maimani, their thoughts on what's going on there. And as well as Pete Fulyun, who's our market watcher for the day, he's got some interesting insights too on two of the companies that reported today. And then a long-awaited interview that my colleague Chris Stain has been chasing down. Johan Ferreira, he's the man who's resisted the taxi mafia and paid heavily for it. He is uh, coming up later in the program. Well, the whole story of the Middle East is seemingly coming to yet another climax. We saw over the past couple of weeks that the Israelis have shifted their attention from the south of the country, the Gaza Strip, well, I suppose southwest, to the north where Hezbollah has been attacking Israelis for the last four decades. This time around, the Israeli Defense Force has been... Um, attacking there with enormous vigor. Let's hear from our colleagues at, sorry, let's hear from our partners at the Financial Times of London how they are reading it. And here, the host of the FT News Briefing, Cassia Brazalian, speaks to the FT's Raya Jalabi, who's actually based in Lebanon. Hezbollah is reeling after the death of its leader, Hassan Nasrallah. He was killed on Friday in a massive Israeli strike on Beirut. Here to talk about where the militant group goes from here is the FT's Raya Jalabi. She's been covering the conflict from Lebanon. Hi, Raya. Hi. What sort of response have we seen from the news of Nasrallah's death? For the most part, across Beirut for the last two days since news first emerged that he may have been killed in this airstrike, it's been shock and disbelief. His loyalists didn't want to believe the news when it first came out, not until 18 hours later when Hezbollah confirmed it themselves in a statement. And when they did, there were wails across Beirut and much of the country. This is a man who has held their attention and held the nation captive for the past 32 years. And in many ways, he was their North Star. But likewise, he has created a lot of enemies. Hezbollah in its early days massacred many, many people, including an attack in 1983 on the U.S. Marine barracks, which were housing U.S. and French peacekeepers at the time. And since then, it garnered them terrorist designations across the world. So there are a lot of people out celebrating his death. And the assassination comes on the heels of a disastrous few weeks for Hezbollah. Can the group rebuild? Experts are slightly divided on the issue, but it depends also what you mean by rebuild. Hezbollah, much like Hamas, its ally in, in Gaza, is built on this sort of idea of resistance to Israel. And as a result, it emerged from a very specific history in Lebanon of occupation and antagonism towards Israel. So the idea of Hezbollah will survive, and it's deeply embedded in the fabric of Lebanese society. So you have an enormous support base of Shia Muslims, in much of whom reside in the country south. And it has an enormous uh, social welfare institution that you know has engendered a lot of goodwill over the last 40 years. That includes hospitals and schools and, and other social welfare institutions. But in terms of its operational capabilities, there's obviously a big challenge here. Over the last two weeks, Israel's campaign launched a series of attacks against Hezbollah that has undeniably decimated much of their communications network. It has maimed hundreds, if not thousands, of their soldiers and fighters in Lebanon. What has Israel been signaling in recent days? Despite scalping someone as senior as Hassan Nasrallah, and despite sort of months of wearing the group down, and despite two weeks of its intensified campaign, Israel has signaled that it's going to keep on going. It's going to keep fighting both in Lebanon and beyond, because Hezbollah was a member of Iran's network of regional proxies, the so-called axis of resistance. And it's clear that it's ready to start broadening its fight if it needs to. And could the conflict expand then? You mentioned Iran. What could we be looking at in the days and weeks ahead? 
The picture is very unclear. So many things hinge on how Hezbollah and its patron Iran decide to respond to the killing of Hassan Nasrallah. Just this weekend, you saw Yemen's Houthis start to participate and they launched a ballistic missile towards Israel. On Sunday, Israel responded by aggressively bombing the port of Hodeidah, which is a Houthi stronghold. So there are indications that the conflict could be spreading. But so far, Lebanon has received the sort of worst of it. There have been more than 700 people who've been killed in the past week of hostilities alone. And more than that, you also have the massive displacement of Lebanese civilians from both the south of the country and the south of the city, the capital, Beirut. So they've been sleeping on the streets and they've had very, very little government intervention because the government is broke and dysfunctional. Broken, dysfunctional government in Lebanon. We've known about that for a long time. But what we here in South Africa need to prepare for is even more shipping coming around the Cape of Good Hope. The reason for that is that as the war in the Middle East intensifies, as Israel knocks out more of the Houthis, who really are the guys who've been controlling much of the sea traffic around the Suez Canal, you can expect that there'd be an acceleration in South Africa uh, in the traffic that comes around this part of the world. Nasrallah, the um, man who was assassinated, was apparently four levels down in the underground, in an underground basement. So it was a lot of bombs that were thrown at him and uh, wiped him out, apparently, at the time that he and his top team, or what was left of it after the pager issues of last week, uh, were watching a speech of Benjamin Netanyahu at the United Nations. Ironies abound. Well, here in South Africa, we have issues as well that are raising red flags, in particular what's going on in the city of Chwani. There was a coalition that had been governing for the last 18 months, led by a Democratic Alliance mayor and an Action SA deputy mayor. They appeared to have been making lots of progress. Well, Action SA's uh, leader and founder, the man who started the party and funded it, Herman Mashaba, a former businessman, is doing his best to prove that perhaps businessmen should stay far away from politics. The decision by Action SA to pull out of the coalition has way, caused a wave of unhappiness, uh, not just in Chwani, but around the country. Here's our political insider, Neil De Beer of the UIM, the president of the UIM, uh, giving us his insights into what's going on there. And he made these comments in the Sunday show, which is hosted by my colleague, Chris Dane. It's a must watch. Uh, the full program is on Biz News TV on YouTube. You can pick that up after this program. I spoke to all the parties actually involved. The fact that we had a blatant attack on Twande, I'd like to refer not to anybody else's docket of presentation, but Mr. Herman Mashaba. Out of Mr. Herman Mashaba's mouth came so many truths and I don't know if he was supposed to relinquish these two. You know, Chris, when I was in the intelligence environment, I got a good tip one day. Someone said, a good intelligence officer does not listen to what a man says. He tries to find out what he doesn't say. Now, I'm clear. I've been in that business 22 years, and I listen the whole week do what Herman Mashaba does not say. And this is what he doesn't say, but he alludes to it. We've got to now look at the non-conspiracy, because I'm going to tell you what is the conspiracy, using all the detail that I now have. So here it is. First on your line, and if people say it's not first, let me then recap. Herman Mashaba says in an interview, that when he decided and was approached by the ANC, Gauteng, to get into bed with him, it now comes through that Mr. Mashaba and whomever of the Le Sufi clan got together and apparently at his house, at his own home, because he says he worked from home. Therefore, it was a personal touch. 
So Chris, he now says, he lets it out, that the plan was never Tuane only. And he actually outlies the plan where he says that the Gauteng ANC with him as Herman Mashal, he very rarely says action they said. He speaks of Herman Mashal. So, Herman Mashal, like him or not, spoke the beat. And he said to us that the plan was always going to be, and he says it, Joburg first, then Ekru Levi, and then Tswane. He says it. So let us move away from this Tswane initiative. This was a constructed battle plan, forged in the doldrums and cauldrons of the Lesufi cave to absolutely ensure that he and his clan, he and his faction, if you want to call it that way, take Gauteng. Politics. Well, moving on to a uh, independent voice, another independent voice, that of Muzi Maimani. Interestingly, he was the leader of the opposition, left the Democratic Alliance, started his own movement, which became a political party, Boza, Build One South Africa. And I caught up with him today to find out what it's been like going back to parliament after you've been the leader of the opposition, in other words, one of the main players, to represent a very small party, certainly at the moment, in the back benches. Well, it's been quite a big job for Mozi because he is also the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, uh, which gives him quite a lot of responsibility. The Appropriation Committee decides on where government spending goes, so he works closely with the Department of Finance, etc. But I asked him as well to give us his thoughts on what's going on in Chwani. And this, from an independent voice, is really worth listening to carefully. You know, Alec, I'll be dead honest. I am absolutely annoyed and angry on behalf of the people of Chwani on that issue. The first is that you are finding this almost, if you like, dichotomy between what is a national government of national unity and the role that of what is going on in the Gauteng uh, uh, if you like, provincial government. And there are two things that are problematic. The first is, I'd like to highlight the fact that in the configuration of the government of national unity, I'm not convinced that the DA has been effective at being able to bring its own policy and policy influence into that discussion. It's become solely, both on party side, a sense of how do we lobby for positions, and South Africans have become accustomed to now you've got ministerial positions for Party A and Party B, but what we don't have as South Africans is actually a policy framework that guides who, where we are going and who are the best players to take us through to that. The second is, when you look at Chwani, the pain that sits here is whether or not you can objectively say, have things gotten better or worse in Chwani? You know, the mechanism of a motion of no confidence was never to settle political scores as what I believe Action SA is doing. It was always to give confidence to whether the government was doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And therefore, when you use these tools for political purposes, you not only uh, leave citizens lingering on the sidelines, who say for many of them are now wondering who in fact they can hold accountable for refuse removal, electricity, the basic services of that municipality, more profoundly the crisis in Haman's Kral with water, but you also let citizens believe that actually it's the politics over the people. And I think that the parties there have, I really genuinely believe, have failed the people of Tswane and failed and potentially have got profound consequences to what happens in that city. What I would really like to see is a cogent plan. It's, it's immaterial in some ways who the mayor should or should not be. What matters is what is the plan that serves the citizens. And secondly, in coalition management, as I showed, in fact, in 2016 to 2019, where the very said Herman Mashaba was mayor of, of Johannesburg, actually what we tended to do up front was to have a written out contract of the things that should be done in that municipality. What are the things that must be achieved? And when you do that exercise, you make sure that you don't have frivolous political motions of no confidence and you manage 
uh, to keep communicating to citizens what are the victories, what are the things that you are meant to be doing, and where you are falling short. I'm, I must be, I must concede. I find this a betrayal of the people. I find that none of us have been well informed about what have been the updates of governments, etc. Tells you a story that, in sadly, it's the triumph of the politicians relative to the people. And that full interview is on the Biz News TV channel on YouTube. One of the points that uh, he did make was that the motion of no confidence that was brought in the metro could be done at any time, whereas in national government, you can only do it once a year. There's a loophole that surely needs to be closed. Moving more on to the investment market's reaction to what went on at Chwani, which has been painted by some as potentially the first crack in the government of national unity. Well, this is an important issue because the improvement in South Africa's standing in investment markets is a direct result of what happened post-May 29th, where the government of national unity was created. The bond uh, rates, for instance, in South Africa are down a couple of percentage points. That decline in interest rates has seen a cut in the prime overdraft rate here, and there has been a direct impact on the valuation of shares on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. So I asked Pit Fulion, who's been a bull on South Africa for quite some time as today's market watcher, to give us some insights into whether he feels that the Chuan eruptions are going to affect the government of national unity and indeed whether he's now concerned about what the next step might be. No, uh, I, I think I said at the outset when the GNU was established that there would be a lot of noise because at the end of the day, it is a compromise between different parties. And as with any compromise, there will be certain points of disagreement which will have to be negotiated. And these negotiations will sometimes take the form of public actions and sometimes take place in private arenas. Uh, what happened to Chwani is a public negotiation uh, process. And I think we'll see a lot more of that going forward. So I, I expect volatility. I expect the move not to be a smooth process. It will be a volatile process, uh, and um, and it, it will be volatile as a result of the different partic participants in the news uh, negotiating position. So I don't think it comes a surprise, and it, it doesn't at this point, uh, unless all GNU falls apart. Uh, but at this point, this sort of reaction wouldn't change my investment stocks. I'm just thinking on that because so much is now being put on the ability of politicians to work together in the public interest. But they, they haven't got a very good track record in our country of actually achieving that. Well, in any country, <laughs> as it happens, I, I, if you look at what's happened in the politics of the UK over the past five years, it's been a, it's been a much greater clown show than anything that GNU goes around. So, and the U.S., I mean, is the uh, case in point. I mean, what's going on there is ridiculous. Uh, so, I, you know, politicians, yes, uh, I, I don't think they always work in the best interest of the country. Um, politicians work in their best in, in their own best interest, and that their best interest is to try and get elected again. So, to the extent that the new can be successful in creating an environment where most South Africans' lives get better, that increases the electability of the politicians who are part of the GNU, and that is in their interest to carry on doing what they're doing with the GNU. So, uh, you know, as long as they're acting in the best interest, um, I, I think it can carry on, and I think it can work in our favor as citizens of the country. We're going to hear some more from Pitt in the next little while on this episode of the Biz News Briefing. But on to a businessman who has stood his ground against the taxi mafia. His name is Johan Ferreira, and he spoke earlier today with my colleague, Chris Stain. It's the proverbial, you know, tail that wags the dog. You know, it's, it just follow the money. Just follow the money. Why are there no arrests? I believe the police, the traffic department, um, government, are all in cahoots. They are a golden thread 
that they are not to be touched, hands off. You know, and, and, and I believe it's money. It's all about the money. It's all about the money. Well, you have refused to pay them uh, a, a levy. What, when last did you hear from them? Are you still getting threats? <laughs> what, what are the most recent incidents? I think, I think, you know, we have touched on the right nerve when we took the police to court and the Minister of Police and the MEC and the you know, MEC of Transport. We didn't take the taxis because, you know, they are like a man of straw. You know, <laughs> you don't get a real address. You don't get a real name. You don't get a real, nothing is real. Okay? Everything is underground and undercover. So um, we have gone after the police and we have put tremendous pressure on the police. So far, uh, in so far as we have uh, established and taken the commissioner, the National Commissioner of Police, to task where uh, we've taken him to court and we said you are in contempt of court and the, and the court found him in contempt of court. Both the local Eastern Cape Commissioner of Police and the National uh, you know, Commissioner of Police were found in contempt. And only then, you know, they started to write two, three lame letters, had two, three lame, um, you know, meetings, just, you know, to try and put up a smoke screen and say, well, you know, we are doing something. You can't really put us in jail. We, we, we've done something. We've not done it, but we've done something. You know, and this is how they get away literally with murder because nobody's arrested. 194 cases. That's unforgivable. That's unforgivable. Johan, what has this cost your company in financial terms? No, hundreds and millions of rand. But, you know, it's not about the money. It's about the lives. The lives being threatened, people being traumatized. Um, Donkey Kai that lost his life. You know, his late wife came and she literally washed his blood from the pavement and from the cement outside in our yard, the bus yard. I saw him a few minutes before he passed away. And, you know, even that shouldn't have happened because we waited about 45 minutes for the, for the ambulance. How can you wait 45 minutes in a city for an ambulance? And the police are standing there. We can't touch him. We can't help him. We can't do anything. They prevented us from helping him. You know, there's so many things in South Africa that's just so wrong. That is just so wrong. And there's this man, lost his life. He came to do an honest man's work. And he was shot in broad daylight outside my office here in the street. No, and there's you know, been no justice. No, but, you know, I will not rest until justice are being brought forward and somebody is being held accountable. I'm not going to stop. Otherwise, I will be held accountable one day. You know, God's asking, is going to ask from me, what have you done? What have you done? You've been in charge of this company. This man was in your service. What have you done? I'm not going to get that. I'm not going to get that question. Somebody else is going to get that question. Johan Ferreira, uh, looking at a higher purpose. Good for you, Johan. He's with Intercape and making global headlines on the fact that he is standing firm against the taxi mafia. Let's hope that Ian Cameron at the crime or the police uh, committee at Parliament will be listening carefully to that. I know Ian is a big fan of Biz News. In fact, he's going to be at the Biz News conference in March next year. And uh, he is also someone who is working on a higher purpose. Coming down to earth now, the JSC today was full of red ink. Uh, the all share index down about three quarters of a percent and the resources leading it lower. Some big losses on the resources side, but it's only really giving up ground that had been gained in the last week or so. Uh, Anglo Platinum, uh, Harmony, Anglo American, Anglo Gold. All coming under some pressure. Uh, interesting to see Robex, the well-performed construction company, also down by about 4% today. On the way up, Kumba Iron Ore, presumably this is a knock-on effect from the re-stimulation that we are seeing in China. That did well, and so did Sassel. But outside of that, it's been a pretty gloomy day for the JSC. Not serious, though, given the recent gains and uh, the fact that the market is at an all-time high. 
One of the companies to report today was York Timbers. Now, it's an interesting business from the perspective of retail investors. 4,500 shareholders in this company. So many retail investors, many small investors who have an interest in it. And they've been very happy, no doubt, to see the share price up 40% in the past year. But no dividend has been declared yet again in the 12 months to the end of June. Uh, good news for York Timber is that it did rebound from a loss of 77 cents a share uh, in the year to June 2023 to a profit of 29 cents a share. So maybe those dividends will be on the way at some point in time. Um, and the net debt, however, went up by about 70 million rand. And that's because of an expansion of the business and a expansion, therefore, of working capital, which is now sitting at just over, well, debt totally is uh, just over 400 million. Something that bothered me a little, given what has happened at Tongart Hewlett, was that the auditors approved an increase of 11% in the value of the forests, the assets that York Timber has. Now, we know what happened at Tongart Hewlett where the increase in those biological assets uh, pushed the valuation of Tongard Hewlett way above what its true value was. And eventually, after the company had borrowed so much against the value of those or the inflated value of those assets, the whole pack of cards came tumbling down. Right now, York's um, uh, York Timber's net asset value, based on the value of its timber, is sitting at around six rand a share. The share price is at two rand twenty five. So I asked Pit Fulun for a little bit of insight into this. And indeed, if that eleven percent increase in the valuation of the forest, remember that's more than double the inflation rate, was something that we need to be a little concerned about. Look, I think one needs to look at the assumptions that are being used in the calculation of the standing value of the timber. I haven't looked at it personally, so I wouldn't be able to comment on exactly what those assumptions are. I'd take a step back and look at the management and the incentives that drive management. Uh, and at Tongard Hewlett, um, I think there were uh, significant incentives in terms of share price and options and those sort of things which drove short-term actions, which drove management to start inflating asset values. Uh, and once you start down that road, um, it gets quite treacherous, uh, and I think they couldn't stop. They carried on and on and on until um, and until they got into a, a, a situation where they actually were committing fraud. Uh, if you look at York, um, for a long time, York was owned by a private equity business, which is trying to justify the value because they, you know, they can only own a company for ten years. Uh, they invest, and then when their fund runs out, they have to sell it. So they were also in a way incentivized to inflate the value. Uh, and they, I wouldn't say they did so by underhand means, but I, you know, there was a lot of uh, positive accounting uh, methods being used, uh, which the market sourced from. And you can see that the Yorkshire price done nothing for years and years and years. But about two years ago, new management has taken over. I think uh, the guys also run Novus have taken a big shell in it. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, Andre van der Fien and others. And I think these people are good capital allocators and will do the right things for the business over the long term. So just judging by who's in control and what the incentives are, uh, I think uh, uh, the long-term investors probably should have a look at the York. And Pete Fulion says, as a long-term investor, you should have a look. Have a look. He mentioned Novus. Novus, is, of course, is a printing company. Makes a lot of sense for Novus to get its timber or its pulp and paper. Uh, almost a bit of vertical integration. They're interesting uh, that pick, picked that up. I also asked Pete about Renogen. This is a company that has been through its ups and downs. It's based in the Free State in Virginia. Uh, it explores and develops gas, in particular helium, wanting to be or ambitions to be one of the world's top helium companies or suppliers of helium into the world. Its quarterly results to the end of June were released today. 
Um, the company's liquefied natural gas production was stable at about 1,250 tons, but it did say that it is now starting to produce. It had two high helium exploration wells completed. Seems to be going in the right direction. The share price was steady after the release of results, but at 10 rand 84 cents, it's down 36% in the past 12 months. I asked Pitt if he knew much about this business. Uh, it's it's something I looked at it a while. I, I think I owned it for a for a brief period. Um, it, about when was it? In when they just started out in 2019, around about there. But then it got, and again, these are these are subjective things. These are not you know it's it's not quantifiable. Uh, but at one point, it became very promotional, uh, and that's when I decided to sell the shares because it became over-promotional. And, and once management becomes promotional like that, it, it's almost like they're trying to, to sell you stuff uh, instead of uh, actually creating value. So I, I haven't followed it since then. Uh, I know that they've made certain promises to the market, and those promises have not yet been kept or fulfilled. And uh, I think the market is now in show me mode. It has to show the market that it can produce uh, gas, that it can produce helium at the quantities which it said it would. Um, and it's now about two or three years behind where it uh, said it would be. Uh, so I think it, it, it has a credibility problem. And the only way to solve a credibility problem is to do things rather than say you're going to do and today, the quarterly results coming out from that company, which says they have now started producing helium. So it's not testing anymore. They're in production. However, they've had uh, they've stubbed their toes on a few of the production issues as well. But at least now we can we'll be able to watch it. Mm. Yeah, and and that's so with almost any engineering uh, and mining project is that it takes longer, it costs more, and there are many more problems than you think there will be at the outset. So it's 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 not unique for energy. It's so it's the same with any mining or engineering project. Pete Fillion from ReCM brings our program to an end for this Monday. We'll be back again, same time, same place tomorrow. Remember that we're just giving you a taster of the work that we do at Biz News and uh, pulling out some of the highlights, the news highlights for you on a daily basis. You can go and watch those full interviews on the Biz News TV channel on YouTube. Until the next time, from me, Alec Hogg, cheerio.